Hello and welcome to this episode of Felonious, a podcast where we discuss the realm of true crime. From chilling cold cases to the wild and wacky, we'll explore it all with a perfect blend of seriousness and humour. My name is Emma and I'm Nazia. To keep up to date with what's coming up, be sure to follow us on Instagram at felonious.pod and visit our website feloniouspod.com. We hope you enjoy this episode, so let's get to it. Right, so no banter this week. Yeah, no time for banter this week. On to serious business. Uh, should we just get straight into it then? Yeah, let's, let's go. Right, so you said that I did some of the name, like uh, Thomas Quick's original name. You said my pronunciation was, what was the accent, the dialect that I did it in? So <laughs> at one point in the recording, you did a, Skons- a Skonska accent which is like southern Sweden, it's quite, well, to me, it's quite thick and it's, it's sort of Danish sounding as well. Okay. It's, but it's got like a French kind of, <laughs> you know, the R in his name, it kind of went French, Frenchified. Right. So that's, why, <laughs> that's why it sounded a bit Scornish. Yeah. So it's going to, that's putting pressure on me now to... <laughs> Because I, I have no recollection, like I have no memory of how I pronounced it. I'm just trying to pronounce it as how I heard it on the documentaries and various videos. Because, um, you know, obviously like reading the books, it's hard enough remembering all the names. That's why I wanted to watch the documentary because I was like, okay, I need to hear these names <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to see how they're pronounced. So, so let's see how I go today. Part one to this episode looked at the early life of Sture Bergvall, uh, also known as Thomas Quick. So just a reminder, before, the, before his confessions, we know that he was a sex offender and he had attempted to murder another man and a young boy. Um, and he was also struggling with drug addiction throughout his life. So in part two today, we will look at the eight murders that he was convicted of and the questionable actions of both the police and his therapists. If you missed part one of this episode, it is available to listen to. And it's a very, very short episode compared to this one. But it's important that you understand his background and how he got to where he got to in today's episode. So there's going to be discussions of murder, child and sexual abuse, cannibalism, drug abuse, alcoholism, uh, lots of bastardised Swedish pronunciations, more from me. And some from me. Yeah, but you've got you've got a (laughs) a more experience. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I'll let you go through the resources (laughs) because I'm going to butcher the names. (laughs) So the research sources, uh, we list on our website anyway, but um, the bulk of it came from Hannes Rolstam's book, uh, Thomas Quick, The Making of a Serial Killer. We also watched a documentary called The Confessions of Thomas Quick, which is a film for production. We also read a book by Dan Josefsson called The Strange Case of Thomas Quick. And I also watched a Swedish documentary on Swedish television called The Murders in Apoyura. That's uh, the bulk of our research, basically. So we'll we'll start off with the case of Johan Asplund, who was uh, an 11-year-old boy, and on the morning of the 7th of November 1980, he went missing. His mother had said goodbye to him at their house, and at 8am, Johan left to walk 300 metres to school, but he never made it. The parents reported it to the police, who deployed helicopters equipped with thermal cameras and search parties to look for Johan. But there was no sign of him. His parents did press interviews and documentaries to try and find their son. Although Anna Clara and Bjorn Asplund were separated, they remained close and put everything into finding their son Johan, their only child. Anna Clara suspected that a man she used to live with was the culprit and that he had abducted Johan out of jealousy. Her ex-partner said, however, that he had been at home during the morning Johan went missing and didn't wake up until 9am. But there were witnesses who said that he left his house 
at 7.15am and his car had been seen outside Anna Clara's house around 8am near the time Johan went missing. The ex-boyfriend's best friend even went to the police to say that he suspected he was Johan's abductor. But the police could not find any substantial evidence to say that he did it. Four years after Johan went missing, his parents hired a lawyer in order to start a civil case against their ex-boyfriend. In what turned out to be a unique case, the ex-boyfriend was found to have abducted Johan and was sentenced to two years. However, the case went to the appeals court and the sentence was overturned one year after the civil trial. The Aspens were ordered to pay the legal fees of the ex-boyfriend around 600,000 crowns, which is 140,000 euros today, but it was dropped by the government out of clemency. The police stopped looking for Johan and for his murderer. Then on Monday the 8th of March 1993, Anna Clara and Bjorn Asplund found out that Thomas Quick had confessed to the murder of their son, Johan. They found out through the media when a journalist from the newspaper Expressen phoned them. Anna Clara then phoned the police who confirmed what the journalist had told her. It was through an Expressen article the following day that Johan's parents found out about how he was strangled and then buried. Although Johan's father didn't believe the confession, as he was certain it was Anna Clara's ex-partner who did it. In his confession, Thomas Quick said that he picked Johan up outside his school, lured him into his vehicle and drove to a wooded area where he sexually assaulted him. Out of panic, he strangled Johan and buried parts of his body in different locations so that nobody would find him. And it's important to remember at this point that Stura hadn't passed his driving test until 1987 and Johan went missing in 1980. The public prosecutor, Christoph van der Krust, announced that Thomas Quick had identified the places where he had buried Johan's body parts. Police technicians using cadaver dogs were deployed on the search for Johan, but nothing was found. The prosecutor said, the fact that we have not found anything doesn't necessarily mean there's nothing there. However, due to the little evidence they had to connect Thomas Quick with Johan, they couldn't arrange for a trial. Quick was one of ten people who had already confessed to murdering Johan. A quick note about van der Krust. At this point, he had only been involved in one other murder investigation, which didn't come up with anything. And according to records, he spent most of 1992 looking at speeding offences. I'd be, I mean, I guess we'll never know the answer to this, but I'd be interested to know why van der Krust was assigned to this case if he'd never done a murder investigation before. As we go through this episode, you wonder that about everyone who's involved. Yeah, that's true. But as a starting point, yeah, I mean, this is quite a big case. There's a lot of question marks as we go through this case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, we answer some in the next part as well, episode three. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, keep tuned. <laughs> Before Stura confessed to the police about the murder of Jan Asplund, his therapist, Shell Pearson, decided it was a good idea to travel to Sundsvall with his patient on the 26th of October 1992 to see if his memories would become clearer. But as the case had been heavily covered by the press, Stuer wasn't sure if he had memories of killing Johan or if it was just something he had read about in the papers. Johan Asplund disappeared from his neighbourhood called Postvedjan. When Shell and Quick arrived in Sundsvall, they saw a signpost for Postvedjan Shell suggested that they went in that direction, but Quick didn't object and wasn't able to say if it was the correct way or not. They then drove around and came to an area where Quick started to have a panic attack. When he had recovered, he told Shell Pearson that it was the place where he had murdered Johan Hasbland. And I know I've uh, said Stura and Quick already, but they are the same person. Yeah. <laughs> the pair then returned to Seattle Hospital and at no point did Pearson note down the private reconnaissance 
or about the confession of murder of Johan Haspeland. Pearson didn't inform the police or hospital management, yet he was completely convinced that Quick had done it. It was his duty as a doctor to break the confidentiality principle if a patient had admitted to a crime with a tariff greater than two years. By keeping the confession out of his notes, he was able to carry on the therapy without notifying the police. In February 1993, Pearson went on holiday and Quick had to have his therapy sessions with a psychologist named Birgitta Stoller. She was so shocked by Quick's admissions of murder that she contacted Joran Franson, who was responsible for Quick's care. He didn't admit to her that he had been made aware by Shell Pearson about the murder confessions, as it wouldn't have looked good for him as he hadn't passed the information on to the police either. Then 11 days later, Franson writes in Quick's file about the murder confessions and that he had informed Quick of the legal ramifications and that Quick himself must contact the police to make right his wrongs. He notes, I want to give you a chance to go to the police yourself, but if you don't make a report within two weeks, I'll have to do it myself. Quick had agonised about the two-week period. He felt that he couldn't confess to lying about everything in therapy as he believed nobody would believe him, so he instructed Joran Franson to contact the police. And in Franson's reports, Quick referred twice to the murders as fantasies and imaginary visions, and that he didn't know for sure if he had killed anyone. But Franson was so convinced he was a murderer and wrote in his notes that Quick was scared that he wouldn't be able to remember factual details for the police interviews. And Franson advised him to write things down so that he was prepared. He also convinced Quick that he had repressed memories, so didn't even consider for a moment that Quick had lied. Doesn't sound dodgy at all. No, it's all, all completely above board there. Yeah. A senior officer, Jürgen Pearson, interviewed Quick on the 1st of March 1993, which was recorded. Shell Pearson was also present. It was part way through the interview that the officer realised that Quick didn't have any legal representation. He confirmed with Quick that he knew he had a right to a lawyer, but Quick hadn't thought about legal presence. The officer then informed him of his rights and then asked Quick if he wanted to contact a lawyer or leave it until later. Quick turned to his therapist, Shell Pearson, and said, We never thought about that. And Pearson said, No. Quick believed a lawyer's presence would be good as a neutral person in the room, but the officer then stops the video recording. The officer put in his report that he had a discussion with Quick about it. The interview then resumed without the presence of a lawyer. The officer also didn't seem bothered or troubled by the fact that Quick and his therapist had been at the location where he said he murdered Johann Asplund weeks before reporting it to the police. Shell says in the interview that he knew where he was going when he took Quick to Sundsvall as he had looked up Johan's address beforehand but that he wanted Quick to show him the way. Quick also confessed in the interview to another murder of Thomas Blungren which happened in 1964 in small land. Officer Pearson wasn't satisfied with this and pressured Quick into confessing to more recent murders he may have committed but Quick refused. The interview that had lasted three hours was then terminated and Quick was notified that he was suspected of murder. So, just to avoid confusion, there's two Pearsons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, one is an officer. Yeah, and one is the therapist. Yeah, and both of them don't seem to be great at their jobs. No, so I, think, I think we'll need to put a names list on. Yeah, we definitely will have to. Yeah. <laughs> So, moving on to Thomas Blumgren. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, getting there. <laughs> so, seven months after his police interview regarding Johann Asplund, Thomas Quick was interviewed again in regards to the murder of Thomas Blumgren. Before the interview, however, Quick went to the library during his allowed leave and looked up newspaper archives around the time of Thomas Blumgren's murder. 
Thomas Bloomgren left his home at 9.40pm on the 16th of May 1964, which was Whitsun Eve. He headed towards Falkett Park to go and see a show and was seen by other locals heading to the park. They also saw a man standing under some trees nearby. He was described as a well-built 45-year-old with a round face and dark back-combed hair. The witnesses didn't recognise him as a local. At 9.45pm, a witness saw Thomas near to where the strange man was situated. Thomas always used this road as a shortcut to get to the park. After the show he went to go and see, Thomas didn't go straight home like he promised his parents, but instead stayed in the park. When he finally left the park, he was an hour later than he told his parents, who were anxious with worry that they had started to look for Thomas. At 1.30 that night, his parents called the police. There were search parties organised, but there was no trace of Thomas. At 10.30am on the 17th of May, a caretaker went to pick up something from his brother-in-law's shed when he found the body of a dead boy. He had been thrown into the shed, head first, among bicycles and tools. He had blood smeared on his face and his belt was undone and his trouser button had been torn off. Thomas had been a victim of a very violent sexual assault. Quick was interviewed on the 27th of September 1993 by Seppo Pentonen about Thomas Blumgren's murder. Shell Pearson was again present in the interview. Quick later explained that he committed this murder due to his father's sexual assault on him in the woods in 1963. The name of the town Thomas Blumgren was murdered was too painful for Quick to say out loud but he described the area very well and said, I can only say it's a town in Schmolland and it starts with a V. Pentanen confirmed he meant Vexio. However, during the interview with Officer Jürgen Pearson on the 1st of March, Quick said it took place in an area called Alvester or Jungan. Then Schill Pearson chimed in and said that Quick had to give the wrong name because of the painful emotions surrounding the name of Vexio. Pentanen then asked Quick how he managed to get to Vexio at the age of 14 and especially when he lived 550 kilometres away. Quick replied that he got there by car, but he wouldn't say with whom. In the interview on the 1st of March, Quick explained that he hitched a ride with a man called Sixten Eliasson, who was 10 years older than him, and that he drove a Borgford Isabella. Yeah, the acquaintance that was interviewed in 1964 provided the police with evidence that he purchased his car a year after Thomas Blumgren was murdered. But this interview was kept secret for 16 years and the transcripts for the interview were hidden inside Pentoner's office and he later admitted he had it in 2009. And that was only because of he was asked repeatedly to provide yeah so in part three we we talk more about pentanen and yeah and how these documents suddenly saw the light of day the light of day yeah <laughs> but he was questioned loads of times by journalists and other people to provide these transcripts but he didn't until the very last minute yeah Quick saw Thomas Bloomgren in the park on his way home when Quick asked Sixton to follow him in the car they caught up with Thomas once they were away from the park. The driver, Sixton, held Thomas's arms while Quick gripped him from behind and had his right hand across Thomas's nose and mouth. Quick said that Thomas had a nosebleed and then lost consciousness. Quick then carried Thomas to a shed and left him there. The level of detail in his descriptions of the murder matched the facts that Seppo Pentanen had. Quick was even able to draw an accurate sketch of the tool shed which is a bit surprising as he described the hiding place of Thomas's body as being under a rotten ladder in the woods in his first interview on the 1st of March. He had also originally claimed that he strangled Thomas and not suffocated him. Despite being suspected of double murder and sentenced to closed psychiatric care, there was an agreement between the prosecutor van der Kvast and the hospital doctors that Quick should have the freedom to be in the community and go on unsupervised visits. The officer working on the case later said that there was a vital witness who saw Thomas leave the park at 11.30pm with a 40-year-old man and headed in the direction of some trees where other witnesses saw a man in the same spot earlier in the night. 
So Quick didn't fit in this narrative at all, as he was only 14 years old at the time. The police managed to identify the man that witnesses saw hiding under the trees and he was arrested on the 6th of January 1971. He was the same man to have left the park with Thomas, according to the key witness. The man was kept under arrest for a long period and his defence lawyer appealed against it, with the appeal court voting 3-2 to two to release him. Crime scene technicians took soil samples of the area where the man under the trees had been seen. These samples matched those taken from Thomas's clothes. This means that Thomas was murdered here and then his body was placed in the shed. Because this information was kept from the press, Quick was not able to read about it and so didn't include it in his confession. The officers working on the case were never asked for assistance from prosecutor Christa van der Kast, and they couldn't understand how he had linked Quick to the crime. If the officers were allowed to be involved in the questioning of Quick, then they would have been able to tell he was lying. Also, he had an alibi from when Thomas Blumgren was murdered. Stura and his twin sister Gunn had confirmation, a Christian ceremony, during the time Thomas Blumgren was murdered. Those who had confirmation at the same time confirmed his alibi, with one remembering Stura carrying the baptismal font. His twin sister even confirmed it to the police when she was questioned by them, and nowhere in the investigation material was this interview ever mentioned. The driver, Sixten Eliasson, who allegedly gave quick a lift to Vexio, was never questioned. Years later, Sixton said that he had been questioned by police three times, which again were left out of the investigation material. But a journalist, Gub Jan Stigson, approached van der Quast in 1995 to say that he knew the identity of the driver. Van der Quast refused Stigson's calls, so Stigson reported him to the parliamentary ombudsman for absenting himself from an opportunity to receive information of importance to the investigation. Van der Kvast replied and said that the driver's name was unknown to the investigation, which is bullshit because they had already interviewed him three times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot to take in just from one case. <laughs> and also that's two murders where the very likely perpetrators have sort of gotten away with it. Yeah. And they don't match quick as in like the description of the person. No. They- and the circumstances. And not quick at all. Yeah, yeah. There's just so many questions that should have been asked but weren't, and and so many that were ignored. So many supposed loose ends that should have been challenged mm. and weren't. So in 1993, Joran Shelbury became the chief physician at CETA and became concerned with the press attention Quick was receiving after his confessions. He got more name confusion. He spoke to Joran Franson and Shell Persson, Quick's doctors, about his concerns over allowing Quick to have leave when the two murders he had just confessed to were under investigation. Franson and Persson said that they had control over the situation but neglected to tell the new chief that they had been conducting their own investigation. Persson and Franson took Quick back to where he had hidden Johan Asplund's body parts. Quick managed to wander off on his own and claimed to have found Johan's fingers. When he was asked what he had done with them, he replied that he had eaten them. They all made an agreement with each other afterwards not to mention it to the police. A few days later, they returned to the area to look for more body parts, but were unsuccessful. One question I have about this is, surely eating... Okay, firstly, those fingers would have been really decomposed. Yeah, I mean... What state would they be in? <laughs> in a, was there any flesh to eat? It's just it bones. Just bones. And eating, deco- you know, if they, obviously there wouldn't be any flesh, but eating anything that's decomposed or bones that have just been lying around on the ground for goodness knows how long, surely that has some health consequences. Yeah. I don't... <laughs> don't want to eat. And why, why didn't they go back and check? At no point did they go back to where Quick had been and checked for anything else. Except what he has to say. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, you ate some fingers that are like over a decade old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just fancied a snack. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I was a bit peckish. <laughs> I was going to make a finger-licking good joke, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to. So Joran Shelbury became even more concerned about Quick in 1994 when he confessed to six other murders. He brought it up with Shell Pearson, who told the chief physician to not interfere. Hold on, that's your chief. Anyway, it's like telling your boss to stay out of it, mate. Shell Pearson then went on sick leave and Shelbury agonised over what to do about Quick. When he spoke to Fronson about stopping Quick's clearance and leave, Fronson responded by going on sick leave as well. What the fuck? Anyway, um... <laughs> <laughs> It was, it's like back in 1979 when everyone phoned in sick and because they were gay. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm feeling a bit unprofessional. I'm going to phone in sick. <laughs> I didn't do my job properly. I'm going to phone in yeah. sick. Oh, it's all too much for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Quick was then informed that his full clearance was cancelled and that he would be locked up on the high security ward with violent criminals. Christa van der Kast was not happy that Quick's full clearance had been taken away and voiced his opinion to Shelbury and said that it would put ongoing investigations in jeopardy. Oh yeah, not, not the fact that um, your suspect was lying or, you know, making everything up. Yeah. That wouldn't put uh, anything in jeopardy at all, no. I mean, in what other situation would you allow a serial killer to just <laughs> yeah. wander in the community to, quote, aid your investigation well at this point he wasn't considered as a serial killer it was just no. two people he'd confessed to but that's true but they considered him a danger to society but nonetheless let him go about uh daily business among everyday people go to the library and yeah you know <laughs> shell pearson was planning to leave Seta hospital for another job at a clinic in lund and he wanted to take quick with him Quick made threats to stop working with the police if he couldn't continue his therapy with Pearson. Shelbury believed that this was some form of blackmail, but this never happened. However, Pearson arranged for a place at a clinic in Vexio for Quick to continue his therapy, but the chief physician there said no. Then, Christa van der Kvast got involved and persuaded the chief physician to allow Pearson to preside over Quick's therapy. What right has he got to get involved? There's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of overstepping of boundaries here, professional boundaries in this situation. Like you've got two therapists telling their boss, don't interfere. You've got a police officer telling psychiatric professionals how to do their jobs. Yeah. Supposedly. Yeah. It's a bit... A bit murky waters, a bit, bit yeah. muddy. There was a problem with the therapy at Vexio for both Pearson and Quick. The clinic didn't allow any forms of benzodiazepine, which Quick was medicated with. Pearson told Quick that it would sort itself out, but it didn't. Pearson had to reduce Quick's intake of the medication, which caused him to go through severe withdrawal symptoms. Without the benzodiazepines, Quick couldn't talk about his memories with Pearson. Quick couldn't stand even the higher security at Vexio, so he called Seta Hospital to say he wanted to go back and they agreed. Quick then resumed a moderate dose of benzos, but his therapy sessions with Shell Pearson ceased. When Quick returned to Seta Hospital, he started to see his new therapist, Birgitta Stolle. On the 14th of April 1994, police officer Seppo Pentanen had a meeting with Quick and his new therapist. Quick let slip that he had been on a reconnaissance trip with his previous therapist and that he had found Johan's fingers. Birgitta Stolle was different compared to Shell Pershing in that she fully cooperated with the police and passed on vital information that came to light during Quick's therapy sessions. And we find out a bit more about why she did that in part three, why she was so cooperative with the police. Yeah. Uh, we move on to the third case of Charles Manovitz, who was a 15-year-old boy who went missing in 1976 after a school disco in Petiol. His family knew something horrible had happened to him and that he wouldn't have disappeared on purpose. On the 19th of September 1993, Charles's body was found by a hunter in the forest just four kilometres from Charles's home. His body was identified by dental records, but there were no forensics found to say that he had been a victim of a crime. 
Three months later, in December, reports surfaced in the press that Charles's remains had been found. A few days later, Crick mentioned during his therapy that he had memories of murdering a boy in Peteor in the 1970s. Quick's lawyer at the time was Gunnar Lundgren. He said something shocking to the press before Quick's confession to Charles's murder. He said, Quick has confessed to five murders, but the police are still not entirely convinced that he's telling the truth. I am. It is therefore going to be my assigned task to convince the police that my client has murdered people. On the 9th of February 1994, Quick was questioned by senior officer Sepa Pantanen. Sepa Pantanen specialised in narcotic surveillance and had only been involved in one murder investigation, the one that Van der Quest had failed on. Quick described Charles as having dark skin and short hair, which is not true. Charles had fair skin and ash blonde hair, which was shoulder length. Quick also said that Charles was wearing a denim jacket with a woolly lining, which was again incorrect. Charles had on a long, expensive leather coat. Quick said that he removed Charles's trousers, but in actual fact he was wearing jeans at the time of his death. He also said that he buried Charles in a shallow grave, but forensics suggested that Charles hadn't been buried at all. Quick's description of how he killed Charles was off too. He used a metal shoehorn to kill him, but the forensic examination found no evidence to suggest that Charles was a victim of a crime. His bones and clothes were found scattered, with big bones such as the thigh missing, which could have been caused by wild animals. Quick was asked if he had cut up Charles's body, but he said that he hadn't. On the 19th of April 1994, Quick was questioned again about Charles's death. Pentinen again asked about whether Quick had cut Charles's body up. Quick said that he and an accomplice were looking for a victim and they came across Charles, and in a nearby wooded area, they strangled him to death and then cut up his body, with Quick taking some home with him. This time, however, the interview started with the tape recorder not being switched on. There was no interview witness and his lawyer was not present. The tape recorder was finally switched on, and Pentinen said, You were sort of developing a line of thinking when we had a break before we started this interview, that you had taken some limb with you, and then in that conversation you mentioned that something had happened to his legs. Do I understand you correctly that you removed a leg? And Quick responded that this was correct. On the 6th of June 1994, Forensic technicians went back to where Charles's body had been found and discovered the lower left limbs belonging to Charles. And so Pentinen interviewed Quick yet again on the 12th of June. Pentinen acted as though the conversation about Charles's missing legs had not happened before. He asked, Is there some limb you're 100% sure should not be on the scene? He asked what sort of limb Quick took with him and he said, A leg. Quick said that he had used a saw, similar to those used to lop logs for firewood, to cut up Charles's body. The only damage to Charles's bones that the examiners found was what was most likely caused by animals. If Quick did take one of the leg bones, then it would have had to have been the right leg, as the thigh bone found at the scene was the left. On the 20th of August 1994, Quick, along with his therapist, Birgitta Stolle, memory expert Sven Ork Christiansen and Seppa Pentinen, took a private plane to Peteor. They were met there by prosecutor Christa van der Quest. This was a reconstruction trip, but it is obvious from documentary sources of the car journey to the scene of the crime that Quick had no clue about where they should go, but Seppa Pentinen knew the way. When it was left up to Quick to choose a way at a crossroad, he chose the incorrect direction, as revealed by Pentinen. Before the reconnaissance trip, Pentinen had taken Quick for a car trip to a forested area, about 30 kilometres away from Serta Hospital. The purpose of the trip was to inspect different ditches. Pentinen made Quick aware about what kind of ditch they were looking for in Peteor by hinting, maybe the ditch looked a bit like this. 
When Quick and Pentinen were looking for the place where Charles Zelmanovitz's body was hidden, Quick said, We looked for ditches like this when we did an inspection in Serta. On another occasion before the reconnaissance trip, the memory expert Sven Orker Christiansen did a reenactment with Quick in the hospital grounds. He told Quick to imagine he was carrying Charles's body, and he counted Quick's steps aloud and told him to stop when he had reached 300. So when Quick was at the crime scene in Puteor, he knew he had to go 300 steps to reach the place where Charles's body was found. They provided Quick with a dummy to act as Charles's body, and the police asked him to place the dummy on the ground exactly how he had placed Charles. The dummy was placed incorrectly by 180 degrees, so they encouraged him to place the body correctly by asking if he was sure and to see how he felt when he did so. But Quick refused, so Pentinen moved the dummy so that it was in the correct position. Quick then broke down in floods of tears and demanded to have a Xanax. The group then left the forest and went for a meal in a restaurant. Quick remembers that everyone was so happy in the restaurant because of the successful reconnaissance trip, but none more so than Sepa Pentinen. They all celebrated with cigars being passed around the table. Firstly, it's the bar is really low for a successful reconnaissance if he's like, like how we did at Seta Hospital and having someone literally reposition the dummy for him. And then he's obviously having a breakdown, probably because he knows he's caught in a big fat lie that he can't now get out of. And now he's doing a shit job (laughs) at maintaining this lie (laughs) because he can't get the reconnaissance right. He's telling even more lies to to go against the lies he's already told. And they're just believing him. (laughs) They're they're not like saying, oh, this... This guy's a quack. Yeah, and then they're giving him the drugs that he's asking for. It's so botched. And the, the fact that Pentanen himself moved the dummy and like encouraged him to like direct them correctly to the scene of the crime. It shouldn't be that way. It should be the serial killer, like criminal, whatever they are. They, they should be doing everything to reconstruct the scene of the crime not the people trying to investigate it. No, but I guess that's how false confessions work in a way, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He's being groomed to into giving the information that they, they are looking for, not... Yeah, to tell the story they want to hear. Yeah. During this time, Quick's brother, Sten Over, was in hospital for a heart operation. Quick phoned his brother, who thought he had phoned to wish him luck, but instead Quick said, I wish that your rotten heart will implode and that you will die during the operation. Quick's siblings didn't want Quick to ever come out of the psychiatric hospital after this. On the 18th of October 1994, the prosecutor Christa van der Krust sent an application to the district court for a summons for the murder of Charles Zilmanovitz in 1976. The trial was set for the 1st of November so the press put out more details about Thomas Quick's background. An article in Svenska Dagbladet said that Quick, from the age of four, was a victim of sexual abuse from his father. On one occasion, according to this article, his mother walked in while his father was abusing him, and through the shock of seeing this, she miscarried and blamed her son for her baby's death. She tried to kill him and even sexually abused him alongside his father. The article also talks about two murders that Quick had committed when he was a teenager in 1964 and 1967 as he had had enough of the sexual abuse from his father. The article also cited a forensic psychologist who examined Quick in 1970 and diagnosed him as suffering from a high-grade sexual perversion. Another forensic psychiatrist told Expressen, if he, Quick, won't agree to castration voluntarily, there is the possibility of forcibly injecting him. Quick had not been charged or prosecuted for these murders, but the press went ahead and assumed his guilt. He was, however, convicted of sexual assault against young boys committed in 1969, 
which he was committed to protective psychiatric care for. Four years later, he was released after being judged a healthy 23-year-old. The Svenska Darbladet article states that it was a mistake to release him because it led to the murder of Charles Zelmanovitz. Before the trial, van der Kvist requested the court bring in additional expertise in psychology and he recommended the memory expert Sven Orker Christiansen. This was inappropriate as Christiansen had been working on behalf of van der Kvist, so he would have been assessing his own findings of quick. The court let him take part anyway and he made his position clear that Quick was in no doubt a serial killer. During the trial, a video reconstruction of Quick at the murder scene was played showing officers how he murdered Charles Zermanovitz. Quick was clearly distressed in the video, in floods of tears. The press said this was a clear sign of guilt. The prosecution had set up a table displaying items of evidence, and one item was the saw that Quick said he had used even though forensic examinations confirmed that Charles's bones had not sustained damage from a saw. Quick then testified without the public being present in the court. He said that he had not read anything about Charles Zermanovitz, which was a lie as he had read newspaper reports before his confession and he had no restrictions in being kept updated on the case. Another shocking thing was that Quick had access to the investigation reports, detailing technical aspects of the case and interviews with suspects. Despite all of this, Quick was found guilty and the courts found it easy to believe he did it as they had not read any of the interview transcripts with Quick. If they had, they would have noticed the errors and contradictions in his statements. This is a quote taken from Hannes Rolstam's book. Under Swedish rules of procedure, there is no obligation for a court to immerse itself in the investigation material. This is called the immediacy principle of the Code of Judicial Procedure. Under this principle, the court only has to put significance to what is observed in main proceedings in court. Even Quick's lawyer, Gunnar Lundgren, didn't bring Quick's interviews to the court's attention. After the verdict, Lundgren did interviews with the press and he was asked if he aided Quick into getting caught for as many crimes as possible and Lundgren said, yes, he wanted to confess to what he had done and so it was my responsibility to help him with that. Yeah, it wasn't your responsibility to support your, your client or... No. Maintain his innocence Or make at all. sure he had a fair investigation and trial yeah and um i don't know if it was this case but like in the documentary they show some of the um, video recordings of the the reconnaissances and it's quite distressing to see when he's like convulsing and like growl you know he's in clear distress yeah you can quite clearly see that he's not well he's he's not mentally well and he's under a, a ton of prescription drugs yeah, it's it's quite it's not a, it's not a comfortable watch seeing those those s- snippets of the reconnaissance where he's having like literal breakdown. Mm. In July 1994, Thomas Quick managed to escape the psychiatric hospital. Quick was out with one of his therapists heading to a golf club for a planned lunch. He suddenly said that he needed to relieve himself, so he went behind an abandoned building. He then ran through the woods and ended up on a road. There he met a young woman and a man who was on trial release from the hospital in a Volvo and quick jumped into the back seat. The escape had been planned. The man in the passenger seat gave quick a bag of white powder, amphetamine, which he proceeded to put in his mouth. Then quick donned his disguise of a blue baseball cap and a t-shirt and shaved his beard. The therapist that Quick had abandoned started to get worried. She searched for Quick, but there was no trace of him. She went back to the hospital and reported what had happened. It was 42 minutes after he escaped that the police put a call out and nobody had any idea where he was. The press, unsurprisingly, found out about Quick's escape straight away. Until now, the press had protected Quick's identity and just referred to him as the Seter Man. But as he was considered to be the most dangerous man in Sweden, a name and a photograph were needed for public safety. 
The woman, driving quick, and the other man realised who quick was and so decided to drop both of them off near an abandoned farmhouse. The men stole bicycles which were unlocked and cycled to the nearest town while hearing sirens and helicopters circling overhead. The two men slept in a tent overnight and then they went their separate ways in the morning. Now that the amphetamine had worn off, it no longer seemed exciting to be on the run, so Quick decided to go to a nearby petrol station and phoned the police and handed himself in. There was an outcry about the lack of security at the psychiatric hospital, but on the 10th of July 1994, someone wrote a letter praising the hospital and its staff while sticking it to the press. Dargan's Nieter published it in an article. My name is Thomas Quick. After my escape last Monday and the massive uproar that followed in the media, neither my name nor my face are unfamiliar. I neither wanted to, nor would I be able to defend my escape from Serta Hospital, but I feel it is absolutely necessary to highlight some of the good work that has been done and continues to be done at this clinic. When I came to the regional psychiatric unit in Serta, I had no memory of the first 12 years of my life, Just as effectively repressed were the murders which I have now confessed to and which are being investigated by the police in Sundsvall. The public then realised that Quick was intelligent and articulate. They got an insight into the mind of the serial killer. He also explains that his escape from the hospital was in order to kill himself and not to commit further crimes. And he said, But I couldn't do it. Today I can take responsibility for yesterday and I think it was this sense of responsibility that stopped me ending my life and made me telephone the police to ask to be arrested. That is what I want to believe. According to notes on Stura's medical records at the hospital, staff were aware that Quick had access to drugs from outside the hospital. Staff were authorised to search him when returning from his allowed leave, and he was caught numerous times with banned substances and pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah, so I think the only reason why he wrote that letter was so that he wouldn't be found out as lying and he could carry on with with his therapy and carry on receiving the attention that he was getting from both his therapist and the police. Yeah, because I think... Which is kind of fucked up. (laughs) Maybe also to do some damage control on any professional consequences for those that are in charge of his care. So he's like, I don't Mm. want to lose these therapists, so I better... (laughs) Put in a good word for them. Yeah. During the autumn of 1994, Quick had a visit from a journalist who asked him if he was being investigated for a double murder in northern Sweden, to which Quick denied. In November 1994, a few days after the trial of Charles Zalmanovitz's murder, Quick phoned senior officer Seb Perpentinen at Sundsvall Police Station and suggested that they look into the case of a double murder in Norrbotten in 1984 as he knew he was there around that time. In summer 1984, a Dutch couple, Janne and Marinus Stegerhus, were murdered. They had been saving up for three years for their dream holiday in the Nordic Alps. On the 28th of June, they left the Netherlands and drove to Jutland in south of Sweden to visit Marinus's relatives. From there they went to Finland and stayed with friends. They visited the Cap of the North, the northernmost tip of Scandinavia, and then drove south into the Swedish Alps, where they planned to camp in the wilderness and photograph the nature that surrounded them. They then experienced issues with their car and ran out of money, so on the 12th of July they decided to head further south to Lake Apajura, where they set up their tent. On the 13th of July, a nine-year-old boy and his family were walking around the lake when they saw the Dutch couple's tent. They saw blood and a figure in the collapsed tent, to which they thought that someone had been hunting and left a dead deer inside the tent. Then they saw a hand sticking out from underneath the material. The family then notified the police. Officer Harry Brenstrom was first to arrive at the scene. He was unaware at the time how big of a case this would turn out to be. The couple had been brutally stabbed almost 50 times through the lining of their tent. The police found a knife outside the tent, which they believed was the murder weapon. The blade had snapped and part of it was later discovered between Yanni's arm and body. The blade broke as it hit bone at an extreme force. 
The police also found the couple's car not far from the tent with no sign of unlawful entry. The next day, the bodies were examined by a medical examiner who determined the couple had been killed in a frenzied attack and that the couple had woken up during the attack as they had defensive wounds on their arms. The evidence pointed to the murderer as having no kind of motive and to someone that was potentially mentally ill. 1,200 people were said to have been questioned during the investigation. Ten years after the murders, police were still looking for a suspect. Then they received a confession from Thomas Quick that filled them with hope that the case would be finally solved. The police officers on the case had not heard of Thomas Quick before, but he had been charged for a murder of a young boy and other serious crimes. He became known as Sweden's worst serial killer. During the first interview with Inspector Sepa Pentanen in November 1994, Quick didn't give too much detail away. Despite this, Pentanen notified prosecutor Krista van der Kvast, who then put in a call to the National Criminal Investigation Department. Van der Kvast was told that there was already an investigation taking place and that there was a possible suspect. This was Johnny Fairbrink, but there was no evidence as yet to link him to the couple's murder and he hadn't even been questioned. Fairbrink was one of Sweden's most violent criminals and had been convicted of 24 other crimes. But this murder didn't match Fairbrink's MO and claimed he wasn't the type to murder tourists. But van der Kvast suggested that Quick and Fairbrink teamed up and murdered the couple together. Jonny Fairbrink was born Jonny Larsen Orna, but he never referred to himself by that name, not even to his friends. The next time Pentanen interviewed Quick, he said that he had taken a train to Jokmok and then cycled to Apajura, a journey that is around 100 kilometres. He had spotted the couple at a picnic spot and decided to attack them that night with his own hunting knife that he had taken with him. He described the Dutch couple's tent as being grey and yellow, or a blue four-person tent, which was situated about 500 to 1,000 metres from the road. He said he stabbed the tent 10 to 12 times with his knife, which we know is wrong because evidence showed that they were stabbed at least 50 times. Quick made a sketch of the knife he used, which had a curved blade with the cutting edge placed on the back. On the side that is usually the cutting side, he labelled this as blunt. Pentinen knew that a knife like this couldn't have existed, let alone cause the wounds inflicted on the murdered couple, so he suggested that Quick should think about another knife and made his own sketch of it. Quick also said that the female victim was outside of the tent at first, and when he attacked her, she retreated back inside the tent. He showed Pentanen in a sketch that the woman was on the left and the man was on the right, but this contradicted the evidence completely as the man was found on the left and the woman on the right, with the tent zipped up. Yanni Stegerhus was killed in her sleeping bag and there was no evidence to say she had left the tent at all. In the investigation done prior to Quick's confession, the police knew that the suspect had stolen a bag and a transistor radio from the tent. Pentanen continually asked Quick about whether he had stolen items from the scene, but he couldn't get Quick to admit that he had done so. Pentanen then asked Quick if he knew of Johnny Larsen Orna, to which Quick replied that he didn't know him. His story of how he murdered the Dutch couple took up 400 pages, which contained a lot of confusing details at the beginning, but then soon made sense as he gave information about the case that hadn't been disclosed to the public. However, he did state that he wasn't completely sure he had anything to do with the murder due to the amount of violence and that one victim was female. Quick tried to commit suicide during the period the interviews took place, as he saw it as the only way to avoid the confrontation with his feelings and thoughts. Two days later, in another interview, Quick changed his story and said that he had an accomplice with him. He said he would often go to saunas with his accomplice and that they had a romantic relationship. This accomplice was Johnny Fairbrink, who Quick referred to as Johnny Larsen Orna. Quick said that they both drove a Volkswagen pickup for about 1,000 kilometres, or around 600 miles to Apajura, but there were no witnesses to say they saw him and his accomplice or the vehicle. And remember, Quick didn't pass his driving test until 1987, and these murders were committed in 1984. Quick insisted that Fairbrink drove the car, 
and convinced him to commit the murder of the Dutch couple. At some point between interviews, Pentanen had called Quick about some of the information he had given and told him that it was incorrect and not so believable. So he gave hints to Quick to say the correct stuff in the in further interviews. It's also quite concerning that he's tried to commit suicide and they're still carrying on these interviews. He's not put on any suicide watch, like no one seems to bat an eyelid. <laughs> Yeah, they're just so concerned about these confessions and about solving these murders. Yeah. But not getting the right person for them. Yeah, exactly. At the time of Quick's confession, Fairbrink was in prison serving a 10-year sentence for murder. The police decided to interview Quick and Fairbrink together. Fairbrink denied knowing Quick, but Quick then said that they definitely knew each other as they had done so many things together. The atmosphere in the room became very strange and Fairbrink became very angry. He then said to Quick, Do you remember the tattoo I have on my leg? And Quick replies, No, I don't. Despite this, Quick repeatedly said that they had murdered the Dutch couple together. Fairbrink was interviewed by the press not long after and he said, This is bloody rubbish. I don't know the guy. I've never met him. Four months into the investigation of Quick being the murderer, Prosecutor van der Kuas was totally convinced by Quick's confession and said to the media in April 1995, I can only say that the deeper we dig into this story, the more certain we are that Thomas Quick is not lying or fantasising. The uh, tattoo that Johnny has is quite a distinct one as well. So if they were... Is that mentioned later on? No, I forgot to put that in there, I think. Okay. I couldn't remember what the tattoo was of, though. I can't remember, but um, in the book, he's like, you know, if if they had slept together and had a romantic relationship, you would definitely remember this tattoo. Mm. But yeah, that doesn't seem to, that seems to go over people's heads. And the fact that he's referring to him by the wrong name. Yeah, that he doesn't refer to himself as. Yeah. On the 9th of July 1995, the police conducted a reconstruction of the murders, 11 years after the Dutch couple were killed. Officer Harry Brenstrom was there as well as Quick, who was showing how he committed the murders. Quick had flown on a chartered flight to the scene with his therapist, the memory expert Sven Orker Christiansen, the prosecutor van der Kwast and Quick's lawyer Gunnar Lundgren. The press were also there after following the police to the scene of the crime. Officer Brenstrom said that the reconstruction was very different to others he had been involved with before. The police decided to place a vehicle where the Dutch couple had parked and put up a tent in the same place as the couples, with people inside acting as them. They did this so that Quick didn't need to tell them how the scene was, which is what Brenstrom found unusual. And during police interviews, Quick had repeatedly placed both the tent and the car in the wrong position. So at the reconstruction, the technicians just placed everything exactly as it was when the couple were murdered. That wasn't the only thing that he found unusual, as Quick, armed with a stick to act as the knife, threw himself onto the tent and it collapsed, which surprised the people inside. He made his way into the tent through the opening and was grunting, while the officer inside the tent was terrified and called for help. Brenstrom said it was really chaotic. Quick's actions didn't match in any way to the facts of the sequence of events. They also had technical issues with the recording equipment, where the recording was interrupted for one minute, but when the camera started again, an hour had passed. During this time, Pentanen spoke to Quick about things he had done incorrectly before the video stopped. The items at the scene were restored and then Quick showed the police what happened during the murder and it matched very closely to what the police believed were the sequences of events. The police then put a lot of focus on Fairbrink, Quick's said accomplice, and looked into where and what he was doing at the time of the murders. You'd think that they would have done that like months prior but... <laughs> Through their investigations it became clear that Fairbrink was not involved as he had an alibi. In September 1995, the police had contact with Fairbrink's ex-wife. There was paperwork from a hospital in Stockholm which shows that Fairbrink was there at the time of the murder. On the 13th of July 1984, his ex-wife had gone to the hospital with him. 
Fairbrink was released by the prosecutor, but Thomas Quick was charged. Because of how high profile the case had become, it was recommended by Officer Sepper Pantanen that Quick should change his lawyer to the celebrity lawyer called Klaus Borstrom. At the trial in January 96, according to Officer Brenstrom who was there, Quick communicated more like an animal than a human. Brenstrom was there for about an hour and said it was very unpleasant. Quick explained to the jury a slightly different account of events than previously mentioned. He said that he took the train to Yokmuk in the hopes of finding a teenage boy as his next victim. He met a group of German youths there and selected one of the boys. He then stole a bicycle and cycled to a supermarket where he met Johnny Fairbrink. The two shared some drinks and then went to Apayura, where the Stegerhoses were camping. Quick said that they went there because Fairbrink had aversions to the Dutch couple, while Quick was targeting the boy who he assumed to be their son. Quick said he asked Jenny Stegerhus about her son to which she denied she had one. Then he became furious. He said, I tried to lift her up so her face was right in front of mine. I wanted to see her fear before she died, but I didn't really have the strength, so I just stabbed and stabbed. When Quick was asked by his lawyer what made him attack the woman, Quick replied, Because of her denial, I identified her with M, and M was the name he called his mother. Johnny Fairbrink was never summoned to testify in court, even though he wanted to in order to clear his name. The memory expert Sven Orker Christiansen testified that he believed Quick's memory to be normal and that there wasn't anything to indicate that his confessions were false. A forensic technician said that Quick's story agreed with the evidence found at the scene. The trial ended with Thomas Quick speaking to the jury and apologising to them for what he had done. In January 1996, 12 years after the murder of Yanni and Marino Stegerhus, Quick was sentenced to psychiatric care. Brenstrom wrote a letter to the judge and said, My sense of justice prevents me from participating in this, at which point he was finished with the whole case. The investigators and his therapists believed that this murder and the others that preceded it were a reenactment of the abuse he was subjected to in his childhood. In 1995, Quick's brother Sten Over published a book called My Brother Thomas Quick, in which he gives his account of what it was like growing up in the family home. He said this to the press about Quick's memories of abuse. I don't doubt that it seems true to him. It's a known tendency for people to be encouraged to produce false memories in therapy. When I heard that a man had confessed to the murder of Jan Asplund, I knew instinctively that it was my brother and I was sure more things would come to light. He didn't believe that their parents were guilty of the abuse his brother said happened. After his brother's book had been released, Quick announced clarifications and in an interview on the 10th of April 1995, he said that his brother, Sten Over, had taken part in the murder of Johan Asplund. In November 1995, Sten Over wrote an open letter to Quick which was published in Expressen. The newspaper phoned Quick before they published the letter to get him to read it. Stenover wrote how he didn't understand his brother's murderous character, but he was still his brother and he wanted to rekindle their relationship. Quick was convinced of Stenover's sincerity and longed to see his brother again. So with the help of journalists at Expressen, it was arranged for Stenover to visit his brother in Serta Hospital. Quick told his therapist Birgitta Stoller about the letter and she reacted negatively and reported it to the chief physician, who in turn contacted Christa van der Quest. He informed Seppo Pantanen and Quick's lawyer Klaus Burstrom. They all had a problem with Quick reforming his relationship with his brother, as he had said that Sten Over took part in the murder of Jan Asplund, which threatened his credibility. Quick understood this worry, but he still wanted to see his brother. The visit was cancelled by the chief physician, who imposed a visitation ban on Stenover. Seppo Pentanen was glad to have dodged that bullet, but Quick fell into a deep depression after this and wouldn't get out of bed and stopped eating. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, it's just a mess. You don't want to feel sorry for him because he is already a criminal, but he is also being abused yeah. at this point. But there's no one stepping in to say, look, stop this. Yeah, he's got no one to help him. No, not even his lawyers. No. 
Thomas Quick, up until this point, had been convicted of three murders. He made confessions not just to the police, but to his therapist and even journalists. In August 1995, Quick said during an interview for Expressen that he committed the murder of 11-year-old Helen Nielsen in Skåne in 1989. Expressen received a tip-off from a stamp collector who had seen a photograph of a stamp auction in Malmö, which is in Skåne, with a man wearing steel-rimmed glasses in the background, and who looked exactly like Thomas Quick. The journalist put the two events together and concluded that Quick was at the auction around the same time that he murdered Helen Nielsen. Helen Nielsen disappeared on the evening of the 20th of March 1989. She left home to meet her friends in the town centre. Her body was found six days later in a plastic sack, 25 kilometres away from her home. Evidence suggested that she had been abducted by a paedophile and had been sexually abused for a number of days before her death. However, there was an issue with connecting Quick to Helen's murder. There was a gap of a year between the photograph being taken at the stamp auction and Helen's murder. Also, the man in the photo was not Thomas Quick. However, Quick didn't let the Expressen journalist know. Instead, he said he had forgotten about the trip, but that he now suddenly remembered. Quick also explained the issue of the year between the auction photo and murder by stating that he went to the auction in Malmo in 1989 and once more in 1990. The paper ran the story and the person who was actually in the photograph at the auction saw the article and called Expressen's rivals, Cavell's Posten, and threatened to sue Expressen for defamation. This didn't stop Quick from making comments to the police that he had killed Helen, but his psychologist, who he was seeing in 1989, gave him an alibi for the murder, so he was never charged. This didn't stop him from confessing to the murders of two boys in Norway and two males from central Sweden, and the murder of Jenen Levy in June 1989, in Dalarna. In the summer of 1995, a programme about the unsolved murder aired in Sweden about an Israeli citizen that had been murdered. Yenon Levy was a 24-year-old holidaying in the region of Dalarna. He was found dead near a forest track on the 11th of June 1988. He had been murdered by two lethal blows to the head and the suspected murder weapon a 118 centimetre wooden stick was found beside him, with flecks of his blood. The details of the murder weapon had been withheld from the television programme. The medical examiner estimated his death occurred somewhere between the 8th and 10th of June 1988. The investigation led to a suspect, but there was not sufficient evidence to take it to trial. The last known sighting of Yenon was at Stockholm Central Station, but it was unclear how he had ended up murdered five hours away in an isolated forest in Dalarna. On the 19th of August 1995, Quick had spoken to Chief Interrogator Seppo Pentanen and confessed that he had carried out the murder with Patrick Olofsson. So uh, Patrick Olofsson was Quick's accomplice in the bank robbery in 1990. And um, if you don't know what we're talking about, go and listen to part one of this episode. Yes. And he was quite young. He was much younger than Quick, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. He was... Yeah. Uh, he was a kid. Still. Yeah. In his 20s, I think. Yeah. So Quick said they met Yenon Levy in Uppsala and got him to accompany them in their car to Dalarna. Quick said that he held Yenon while Patrick punched him and hit him over the head with a heavy object. He described how he had placed Yenon in his car and drove to a forest road where he dumped his body. Seppo Pentanen was sceptical about Quick's confession, as there were so many inconsistencies, but his story did match that told in the programme about the unsolved murder on Swedish TV. Quick's story changed again during interrogation. He was alone when he committed the murder. He had met Yenon in Uppsala and they went to a holiday cottage near Sala, where he killed Yenon by hitting him on the head with a stone. He said he then put Yenon's body in the back seat of his car and drove to the forest track where his body was found. His story kept changing from being with an accomplice to not, and the place of the murder would vary. He was even confused about the murder weapon and where he had first met Yenon. The prosecutor, van der Kust, said about Quick's constantly changing stories 
The difficulty has been that the memories of the murders have been fragmented and unstructured and that sometimes it has taken a very long time before we can piece together various fragments into a cohesive whole because van der Kerst is uh, qualified in psychology apparently. Oh yeah, he knows everything. During interviews and reconstructions, Quick said that the murder weapon was wooden and was asked by Pentanen if there was anything around the scene that would match the length of it while indicating the measurement between his hands. Quick straightway picked up a wooden stick similar to the length indicated that was lying nearby. How convenient. In one of the reconstructions, he said the murder weapon was a crowbar, which had been taken from the car he used to take Yenon to the eventual murder scene. Pentanon asked him if he was unsure about the crowbar, and Quick agreed that he was. He also placed the dummy that was acting as Yenon's body in the wrong place, and it was incorrectly positioned. He also said that his hand slid under Yenon's jumper, and he felt hair on his stomach, but Yenon had no body hair at all. There was a vital piece of evidence missing from Quick's account of the murder. Investigators had found a pair of glasses, which probably belonged to the murderer. Tests showed that they didn't belong to Quick. During questioning, Quick said that he had purchased the glasses from a petrol station to act as a disguise for his accomplice Patrick. But the glasses found at the murder scene had strong prescription lenses, which were not available at petrol stations at all, and Patrick had perfect vision. The glasses were also estimated to be about 10 years old. In January 1991, an assistant at the police unit in Borlinger found something interesting. They had made a connection between the glasses found near Yenon's body to those in a passport photograph. So both the passport and the glasses were sent to a laboratory, which found a high probability that the spectacles found at the crime scene and those in the passport picture were the same. An optical company conducted tests on the passport photo and the results showed that the glasses were the same strength. The passport photograph was of Ben Ali, a 50-year-old North African man. In 1991, he was in jail serving a five-year sentence for assault and theft. He had forced a friend to slash his girlfriend's face with a knife, which was witnessed by her 12-year-old daughter. Ben Ali seemed like the type of violent person who was capable of murder, but what was the motive? An ex-girlfriend of Ali was questioned by the police and she mentioned that Ali used to go to Central Station in Stockholm to look for Arab men to employ in order to sell paintings to the elderly in places like Dalarna, North Sweden and Norway. He would often get them to work in pairs, one acting as a distraction while the other stole what they could get from the elderly. The investigation uncovered that Ben Ali had hired a large number of Arab men between 1986 to 1988. A couple of his friends said that they had met Yenon Levy in Ben's flat in 1988. Yenon's family came from Yemen. His appearance was Arabic and he spoke Arabic, but he was an Israeli Jew and served for the Israeli army during the war in Lebanon. Ben Ali had an extreme hatred of Jews, so he could have found out about Yenon Levy's ethnic background, which would have put Yenon in danger. Ben Ali was considered as a suspect, but he was never charged. After serving his five-year sentence, he was deported from Sweden. Christa van der Kust, the prosecutor, put a stop to one of the investigators on the case wanting to investigate Ben Ali further and a potential other suspect. They also wanted to question an ex-girlfriend of Quick's and they wanted a search warrant of Quick's belongings that were in storage. But van der Kust put a stop to that too. I wonder why. Yeah. Van der Kast also demanded that the medical examiner's report be redrafted to match what Quick had been saying during questioning. He also ignored the examinations done on the glasses found at the scene and dismissed that they belonged to Ben Ali. He got Stockholm's police technical division to go to an ordinary optician store in Stockholm, who came up with different conclusions about the glasses. And most of the police force purchased their glasses at this optician's and received discounts. I mean, that doesn't make sense at all. No. And it's just so unethical. Yeah. It's unprofessional and unethical. Yeah, he's... Van der Quest has just, like, completely ignored the evidence. Like, there's proof that he, he could have been at the murder scene, this Ben Alley. Yeah. And he's just completely ignored it. It's like, don't investigate that route. 
but also don't investigate my <laughs> yeah D- my, don't my... uncover my uh mystic yeah. misdealings with this uh, exactly <laughs> mental hospital patient yeah yeah it had taken a year and a half of questioning and several reconstructions for Quick to be able to tell a cohesive account of what had happened. Quick and his accomplice took Yen and Levy by force from a train platform in Uppsala, where he was put into a car. Yenon was threatened by a knife being held to his throat, while Quick drove to the murder scene. In February 1997, Jan Olsen was one of the investigators who wrote a letter to van der Klaast giving his opinion that Quick was not guilty, pointing to technical and forensic evidence and his concern about the relationship between Pentanen and Quick. Van der Kast never replied to Jan Olsen's letter. In April 1997, van der Kast submitted a court application which said that Quick had murdered Yenon by blunt trauma to his head and upper body, but the prosecution dragged their heels when finalising their case before trial. During this time, Quick tried to commit suicide a number of times and was treated with even more benzodiazepines. He also received a number of death threats, so it was decided that court proceedings would take place at the police station in Fallon. The investigators of the original murder investigation didn't let Penton have access to their findings before any of the reconstructions took place because they had a suspicion that he was leaking information to Quick, and their suspicions were correct. Mm. He was. He would telephone Quick in hospital and tell him where he went wrong during... He kind of, like, groomed him, basically, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, he said, oh, this is what you've got to say, basically, and um, yeah. here's where you went wrong. It's, I mean, this is a really stupid way of putting it, but it's like, Quick would say, oh, I think I used an apple. Are you sure you didn't use something red and round? No, I'm not sure. Are you sure? <laughs> I think you're thinking of an apple. Yes, I'm thinking of an apple. You know, it's like yeah. that's what all the reconstructions were like. Yeah. And you just think how much money, how much, how many, how much resources went into all of these reconstructions? Yeah. I mean, they had to get private jets to take him to places as well yeah. for some of these. And wouldn't that, that have been like taxpayers' money? Yep. It's so dodgy. Like everything in this whole saga is just plain wrong. And then you've got Quick acting like a director yeah. in some of them. <laughs> yeah, so he's telling people like where they should what they should do, where where they should how they should position themselves. Yeah. It's like it's getting a bit too um It's going to his head, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then at the same time He's obviously distressed because he's trying to commit suicide. Yeah, it's just a, it's just And he's awful. still on the benzodiazepines as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A number of his victims' families were at the trial, including Johann Asplin's parents. During the trial, the court said that there was no evidence to link Quick directly to the murder, but that there were not any inconsistencies in his account of the crime and the facts about what the victim was wearing and the wounds he received corresponded to those established by autopsies and forensic analyses. Quick also mentioned that Yenon had found a carved wooden knife in his rucksack, which Yenon had mentioned in a card to his mother. Pentanen said that Quick's changes to his stories were not coerced, but the interview transcripts say otherwise. Quick's defence lawyer, Kles Borikström, did not criticise any evidence or information given by the prosecution. In van der Kvast's closing argument, he said he leaves us with a concrete and accurate picture, far removed from any guesswork. Mm. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, if only you could smell the bullshit in the room. <laughs> <laughs> bullshit detective. Yeah. The court wanted to know why Patrick Olofsson wasn't present in the trial, considering he was named as Quick's accomplice. But the prosecutor and Quick's lawyer agreed that there was no need to question Patrick, so it was left as that. Yeah, there's no need to bring him in. He's, you know. But that happens each time, doesn't it? Because it happened with that Johnny. Yeah. And... Thomas Bloomgren. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Like, Quick was apparently a teenager then. Yeah but they don't find who the old man driving the car for him was. <laughs> no, even, even though they know his name, they yeah. they refuse that the 
you know, to the journalist that mentioned to Van der Quest the driver's name. He said, oh, uh, we haven't heard that name before. But they had interviewed that guy three times previously. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just all a bunch of liars and just after a quick fix to the cases they get their hands on. Yeah. On the 28th of May, 1997, Thomas Quick was found guilty for the murder of Yenon Levy. The district court said that it had been established by the testimony of Seppo Pentanen that the questioning has been conducted in an exemplary way without any leading questions or insistent repetitions, which goes to show that the court probably didn't read any of the interview transcript. Quick was sent back into continued psychiatric care. And in 1997... Quick sent a letter to Van der Quest to say that he wanted to stop the investigations and the reconstructions because he felt like he was going to die, basically, because he was having so many panic attacks and suffered with severe anxiety. We mentioned he tried to commit suicide a number of times. And he also phoned Sepa Penton and, and said the same thing. But, you know, things just went ahead. Yeah, I mean, like, they wouldn't or couldn't put him in jail and he probably would have successfully committed suicide there anyway. Yeah. But he's in psychiatric care, but he's not actually getting any psychiatric care. So. Yeah, and they're still letting him have, like, leave from the... And drugs. Hospital. Yeah. And <laughs> drugs from the inside and the outside. Yeah. Quick continued remembering murders he had committed, including that of Therese Johannesson. On the 3rd of July, 1988, she disappeared from her home without trace in Fjell, Drammen in Norway. It turned into one of Norway's biggest cases and police operations, with 100 officers working to find out what happened to Therese. They questioned 1,721 people and received 4,645 tip-offs and leads, but they didn't lead to anything. In spring 1996, both the Swedish and Norwegian police joined forces to look in more detail at the murders of Therese and two African asylum seekers who disappeared from a refugee centre in Norway's capital, Oslo, in March 1989. Bloody hell, that was a long sentence. (laughs) The reason for this was because Quick had confessed to all three. The confession to Therese's murder was taken with scepticism by some, as it didn't fit his modus operandi. He confessed in the past to killing boys, apart from the Dutch couple. His lawyer, Gunnar Lundgren, was dubious, saying, it's so off-key, so completely different from his usual behaviour. But the prosecutor, Christa van der Kwast, was adamant and told his investigators to broaden their perspectives. Van der Kwast was of the opinion that a serial killer going against his usual pattern of behaviour may be doing it to gain sexual satisfaction. Again, he's not an expert in murder (laughs) or serial killers. Before all of these quick cases, he only took part in one murder investigation and it ended up in failure. And now he's all of a sudden an expert in serial killers. Yeah. Uh, He probably reads a lot of books, you know? A lot of those, uh, (laughs) you know, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. (laughs) Stephen King novels. Yeah, maybe. Because it's beginning to sound like a Stephen King novel. Well, it is a bit like, he must be convincing himself that Quick is some kind of Hannibal Lecter, giving them clues, but they're not actually giving them clues. They're the ones giving him clues. (laughs) Yeah, but part of me thinks, oh, he must have been enjoying the the media attention that these cases brought as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it would have looked good for him in in the police force. So repulsive. Mm. In July 1995, Quick learned that there were many articles about him that had been published in Norwegian newspapers. So he asked a journalist he had been in contact with to send all of these articles to him. The first article concerned Quick's admission to murdering a boy, but the police couldn't identify who the boy was. The next article gave more information and a description of the boy as being 12 to 13 years old and cycling. The last article was headlined Where Quick's Possible Victims Went Missing, which included photographs of a refugee centre in Oslo and two African boys who went missing in 1989. 
Quick confessed to their murders in February 1996 when he spoke to Sepa Pentinen. When Quick had told Pentinen about a 12 to 13 year old boy he had murdered, Pentinen phoned the Norwegian police, who didn't have anyone on record to match the boy's description. They did, however, tell Pentinen about the two African boys who had disappeared in Oslo. In the interrogations, Quick denied reading anything about the murders in Norway, despite his interview with the Norwegian journalist and the receipt of the articles that were sent to him. There were also suspicions in the articles that Quick was involved in the murder of Therese Johannesson. So Quick was able to gather a lot of information about these murders from the articles he received, which he made use of during questioning after his confessions. In April 1996, Quick accompanied Inspector Seppa Pentanen to the area where he said he had buried the remaining body parts of the two African asylum seekers. The police dug up a huge area and a cadaver dog pointed to evidence that there were human remains present, but no parts were found. Then Quick realised he had made a mistake and directed the police to another location. Another inspector, Tura Nesson, received information while the excavation at the new location was taking place. It turned out that the two African boys were in fact alive. One of them had settled in Sweden and the other was living in Canada. The newspaper articles that Quick had didn't detail vital information, which he had gotten wrong during questioning, like what the area looked like and what the weather was like on the day Therese Johannesson was murdered. He described the way Therese had her hair, what she was wearing, including accessories, but he got all of this wrong. He gave them a stereotypical description of a Norwegian girl. The only details he got right were those listed in the newspaper articles. On the 25th of April, Quick was taken to Fjell accompanied by Van der Quest, his therapist, and the memory expert Sven Org Christiansen. He described how he spotted Therese with his accomplice Patrick Olofsson and hit her with a stone to make her unconscious. He then put her in his car and drove away. Quick also gave details about the area and what it looked like at the time in 1988, like the colour of the balconies that had just been painted and where the bank was, and the details were spot on. That's when he was notified that he was under suspicion of murdering Therese. The next day he directed officers to a place called Erdia Forest and led them to a sand pit where he said he had hidden Therese's body. He described how he cut up her body into parts and then threw them into a lake called Ringen. The police took the decision to drain the lake in order to find her body parts. It took seven weeks and was the most expensive crime scene investigation in Nordic history, but the police didn't find anything that could have been from Therese's body. Tori Jonsson, the chief of police of Draman, said that Quick was either a liar or he made a mistake about the location. However, one year later, in 1997, Quick was back in Uria with his entourage. Suddenly, the police had circumstantial evidence that Quick was in the area in 1988, as they had found a tree with a symbol that Quick had claimed he had carved, but in actual fact, they just found a birch tree with some damage or markings which could be passed off as a carving and it was in an entirely different place to where Quick had suggested it was. The mark on the tree didn't match what Quick described at all. The tree would have been extremely thin at the time of Therese's murder, maybe just a few centimetres in diameter. Surely a thicker tree would have made more sense? It's just shambles, isn't it? (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. It comes to a point where you just don't know what to say. Yeah. (laughs) They also found a saw blade and a blanket that Quick said he had left at the scene. There was also the child spot where Quick had burned to raise his body parts. This is where a cadaver dog picked up on the scent of human remains. Forensic technicians also found fragments of bones in the ashes. These were examined by the anatomical expert on the investigation and it was determined that as there was a growth ridge on one of the fragments, the bones likely belonged to a human being aged between 5 and 15. 
The bone was so badly burned that no DNA could be extracted from it, so it couldn't be ruled out that this bone belonged to someone else other than Therese. But the discovery of the bone spurred the investigation on further. And we'll discuss the videotapes of the reconstruction trips for Therese's murder in part three of this episode. Yeah, as well as some more information about this piece of evidence that they found. During the trial, it had emerged that Quick was helped by Patrick Olufsen in the abduction and murder of Therese. Quick has said that Patrick raped Therese in earlier forest. The judges were confused as to why Patrick Olufsen had not been summoned and asked both van der Klast and Quick's lawyer, Klaas Burrestrom, why this was. But they firmly dismissed it and Patrick was never brought into court. Yet again. I feel sorry for Patrick. His name's being dragged through the mud and he hasn't done anything. It is, yeah. He's only a young boy as well. Yeah. He did one wrong thing with... With Quick years ago. Yeah, and now he's just he's paying the price for it. Yeah. The court viewed one piece of evidence as very significant. Quick had described that Therese had eczema in the crooks of her arms. This was not known by the police at the time, and her mother never mentioned this until questioned by the police after Quick's description. During the reconstruction on the 25th of April 1996, Quick said that he remembered Therese had scar tissue on her right arm. At the time of Therese's disappearance in 1988, her mother filled in forms about Therese's physical appearance noting that she had a birthmark on one of her cheeks, but nothing referencing scars on her arms. She then later spoke to Norwegian investigators. She told them that Therese had atopic dermatitis on the inside of her arms. The investigators passed this on to Sepa Pentanen, who in turn asked Quick about it on the 9th of September 1996, six months after Quick had mentioned the scarring on Therese's arms. He hinted to Quick that details about Therese's arms were very important, but Quick didn't elaborate. Again on the 14th of October, Pentanen brought the topic up, but instead of asking about scars on the arms, he says that Quick had mentioned Therese's skin condition in the previous interview. Quick said that he never said that and said it's a flare-up. I'm hoping we mean the same thing by flare-up. Even though he was given information about Therese's arms and a possible skin condition, Quick never said that Therese had eczema, but what he did say about a flare-up was right enough. The bone fragments found at the scene of the murder were never questioned. In the verdict, the court said, even if the remains of organic material found in the forest cannot tie Thomas Quick to Therese, they nonetheless suggest that his story is true. Which means it makes no fucking sense. Yeah. But according to the forensic investigation report, the fragments of bone weighed less than half a gram. Would that have been enough to determine that they were of human origin and of a child between 5 and 15 years old? The anatomical expert in the investigation wasn't able to say where in the skeleton the largest fragment of bone came from. Quick was sentenced for the murder of Therese Johannesson in June 1998. Christa van der Klaas said that Quick had given them 30 unique details connecting him to Therese's murder. Quick said in court, My guilt is fixed and heavy and a suffering to me, but I want you to understand that I have reenacted my own experiences from my damaged childhood. The inquiry into Therese Johannesson's murder lasted two years which included 21 interviews with Quick, who had changed his story so many times that it eventually matched what the police wanted to hear. In 2000, Quick was prosecuted for the murder of two Norwegians, 17-year-old Trina Jensen and 23-year-old Gris Storvik. Trina Jensen was found raped and murdered in August 1981, just outside of Oslo. She had arranged to meet a friend at a tram stop but she didn't show. Her body was found a couple of months later. She had been strangled and the lower part of her body was naked. 
Grease Dorvik was a prostitute and heroin addict who disappeared in June 1985. A witness had seen Grie get into a car that drove off. She was found dead in a car park not far from where Trinne Jensen's body was found. The post-mortem revealed she had suffocated, either by someone smothering her face, but stomach contents entering into the lungs could not be ruled out. The post-mortem also showed traces of semen inside her. Quick admitted to having sex with Grie, but DNA investigations showed that the semen did not belong to him. He also said that Grie vomited, but there had been no trace of stomach contents outside of the body, only in her lungs. He was still found guilty, even though the DNA and other technical evidence didn't point to him. Quick first mentioned Trina Jensen's name during the reconstruction of Yenan Levy's murder in October 1996. At the time, he asked for an interview to pass on information to Seppo Pentanen. While at the reconstruction scene, Quick, alongside his lawyer, Kles Burristrom, gave very brief information about a girl he murdered in 1981, whose name was Trina Jensen. The interview concluded without any questions. It lasted for two minutes. He gave so many details that were correct, but they were also details listed in newspaper articles. Later, in 1997, he brought up Trina's name again, but the investigators, due to their heavy workload, didn't take it up. It wasn't until January 1999, after Quick mentioned Trina's name yet again, that Seppo Pentanen became interested. Quick was interviewed again in May of 1999, when he drew a map of the area he said he left Trina's body in, but it was incorrect. Some people said if it was inverted, then it wasn't as bad. They said that about a lot of his drawings and information that he gave over. Right. Just to, like, say, oh, he drew it oh, wrong, but if you, if you turn it around, it's actually right. If you, if you just look at it upside down <laughs> and flip it. Look it upside and down just and back to front. redraw the whole thing. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> Rub that bit out yeah. and draw it all over again. <laughs> Just search for it on Google. Oh, no, wait, Google doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of May, Pentanen phoned Quick at the hospital to pass on information about clothes and any items he connected with Trina. One important item was the strap from Trina's handbag, which was thought to have been used to strangle her. On the 3rd of June, Quick was interviewed again, and he described killing Trina by stabbing her a number of times with a knife. He said that Trina collapsed and he realised that she was dying, so he attacked her again. This was a completely inaccurate story about how Trina died. He didn't reference the straps on the handbag at all. Pentanen then decided to bring up items that Trina had with her. Quick then mentioned the handbag, but he was still getting details wrong. In August, Quick took the Norwegian and Swedish police to the spot where Trina had been murdered but on the way they drove past a car park, which Quick reacted strongly to. This is where Grie Storvik's body was found in 1985, but the others who were in the car with Quick claimed they knew nothing about Grie's murder. But Norwegian police at this point had already connected the two murders together and suspected that Trina and Grie were murdered by the same person. On the 1st of September, in yet another interview, Quick managed to tell the right story in that the strap on Trina's handbag had been used to strangle her. Between June and September, Quick managed to get hold of information from the Swedish and Norwegian police at the reconstructions, which helped him tell the right story. There were those who doubted Quick's confession, such as journalist Dan Larsen. He thought Quick was innocent and he was suspicious of the fact that nearly all the investigations had been led by the same individuals. Larson published a book, Thomas Quick, The Mythomaniac, in August 1998. In it, he put forward his belief that a local bodybuilder who was addicted to amphetamines, alcohol and anabolic steroids committed the murder of Yanni and Marinus Degerhus. Astrid Holgerson, a witness psychologist, looked through interrogation reports and pointed to instances where van der Kast had led Quick to say the right answers during questioning. He not only did this during the questioning, but at the Trina Jensen trial too. 
Van der Kvast showed videos of the reconstruction and what Quick has said during questioning. So Quick heard these repetitions before he was able to describe events himself in court. No analysis was made of Quick's inconsistencies in his statements or witness testimonies. Astrid Holgerson criticised Sven Orker Christiansen's role as a memory expert as being unethical and unscientific by helping Quick come up with accounts that matched the evidence and the facts the police had. Johan Usplen's father wanted the prosecutor van der Kuss to be put on trial for failing to prosecute Quick's accomplice Patrick Olofsson in the Theresa Johannesson trial. Bjorn and Anna Clara believed that Quick had falsely confessed to the murders, including their sons Johan. It was after the convictions of murdering Trinne Jensen and Gri Storvig that the prosecutor's attention went back to the murder of Johan Asplund. Van der Kvast was still keen to get Quick convicted for this case. Magically, in 2001, there appeared to be enough evidence to start proceeding against Quick for Johan's murder. His parents approved the prosecution and said, we just want an end to this after 20 years, but we'll question every detail during the trial. Van der Kvast told the press that there was evidence to show Quick had been with Johan, but that Asplunds were dismissive and said that they didn't believe Quick was guilty of Johan's murder or of any of the others he was convicted for. Bjorn Asplund said, if against all probability he is found guilty, we'll take it to the Court of Appeal and then the bubble around Thomas Quick will hopefully burst. I mean, considering they're grieving parents, they're so level-headed. Yeah, I suppose it's obvious to them that Quick didn't do it. Mm. At this point, they still haven't found Ewan's body. Yeah. So they don't know if he's actually been murdered or, or not. No, and, you know, the fact that they don't want someone who's not guilty of this crime to be convicted... Mm. wrongfully says a lot yeah yeah i just feel really sorry for them because that yeah they're all like entwined in this whole rigmarole yeah they're being dragged into this circus yeah when they don't deserve it either mm. the trial started on the 14th of may 2001 claire sporistrom was no longer quick's lawyer so sven or Larsen defended him on the first day, Quick detailed to the court how he had tricked Johan into his car, drove him to Nora Stadsberiet to sexually assault him, then drove him to Orvika where he strangled Johan and cut off his body and scattered his body parts in different places in central Sweden. Sven Orka Christiansen, the memory expert, was present at the trial as well as Quick's therapist, Birgitta Stolle. She testified that Quick's traumatic childhood and reawakening of these memories explained why he had become a serial killer. Under oath, she told the court that she was not present during police questioning and that anything mentioned during the therapy sessions wasn't passed on to the police, which is a complete lie. Seppo Pentanen then backed up this lie and said that Quick had clearly defined memories on aspects of the case and stayed true to the central parts of his information. On the 21st of June 2001, the court made its verdict. It acknowledged that there wasn't any technical evidence to connect Quick to Sundsvall at the time of the murder, and there wasn't any evidence to support what had happened to Johan Asplund. The fact that the case was 20 years old was also problematic. However, Quick was able to give precise details, even detailing distinguishing marks on Johan's body despite Pentanen questioning Quick about this for months in order to get the story he wanted. Quick was found guilty of Johan's murder. It was a unanimous verdict. Up to this point, Quick had been charged for eight murders. The Asplunds soon found out that because they supported the decision to prosecute, they were unable to appeal the verdict. Quick had an alibi on the day that Johan disappeared. Hospital records show that on the 7th of November 1980, Quick's mother came home from hospital. This is even recorded in one of his diaries. He also picked up a prescription of oxazepam on the same day. Later on, he explained that he had come across details of Johan's disappearance on a TV programme called Missing. To gain knowledge about the area where Johan lived, he tore a map out of the phone book in a phone box when he was on leave in Stockholm. 
He also had access to the investigation material just before the trial. He was also lent a book called The Case of Johan, which was lent to him by the journalist Gub Jan Stigson. In 2001, Quick confessed to killing Marianne Rugos Knudsen, a seven-year-old girl who went missing in Norway in 1981. Quick also admitted to murdering Ole Högbom, an 18-year-old who went missing in Sweden in 1983. There was also the unsolved case of the body of a three-year-old boy found in a waste bin in Sweden. Christa van der Krust was keen to charge Quick for the boy's murder. This would have been Quick's 11th murder investigation. This, along with other confessions van der Krust had on the list, would keep him busy until he retired. In November 2001, Quick suddenly announced that he would not be taking part in police investigations into the confessions he had made for other murders, and he blamed this decision on the people who doubted his confessions. Van der Quest knew that it would be pointless bringing the other cases he had suspected Quick for to court without his cooperation. Then Thomas Quick was no more. In February 2002, the real man behind Thomas Quick took back his real name, Stura Berival. He remained in the psychiatric hospital and stayed out of investigations, even though more and more people, including the press and detectives, were coming forward to share their doubts about Quick's verdicts. Quick stayed silent for seven years, until 2008, when journalist Hannes Rolstam visited him. And that's the end of that one. Yeah, that was a long one. Um, it's, it's, it just surprises me the lengths the police will go to to make sure this man is found guilty, even though they must know that it's all a complete lie and all a complete farce. Not just the police, but the psychiatric care team. Mm. If you can call them a care team, because they're not really caring for their client at all. No. And it's just baffling how this was allowed to happen. Yeah. You know, and we find out in part three how cushy things get for both Van der Kast and Claire Spo... I can never say his name. Claire Spoelstrom, the lawyer. Yeah, the, the lawyer, how, how cushy things get for them. Yeah, and Seppa Pentanen. Yeah, we also find out a bit more about the you know the behind the scenes of the therapy. Yes, yeah. So we'll definitely go into that. But you know, firstly, all of these victims, for it to be possible for one person to commit all of these murders, that person has no mo, which is very rare for serial killers. But you know, apparently Van der Kast, he's an expert on serial killers, so he's able to explain it. Yeah, with the with that one case behind them, yeah. Yeah, the fact that all of these so-called accomplices were never tried. They were questioned, but never tried. Uh, I don't know if, I don't think Patrick was questioned, but the other two were, and they weren't convicted of anything. Yeah, and they didn't do anything about the Ben Ali guy. No, exactly. I mean, he'd been deported anyway, but they didn't want the police to go down that route of check you know following the evidence yeah and the fact that you know the two african boys which were found to be alive <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like <laughs> okay <laughs> like no one seemed to think oh uh shouldn't we really look into what this guy's saying like could it be that he he's told us lies this whole time and the amount of resources going into all of the reconstructions, emptying the lake, digging up areas, large areas to find nothing. Mm. When has that ever happened in history, like in the history of murder investigations that we know of, you know? Yeah. I mean, that whole dredging of the lake was, like I said, the, the most expensive in yeah. Nordic history. So. Yeah, yeah, and it was completely fruitless. Mm. And the the people that actually did commit these crimes, like in most of these cases, they they passed the statute of limitations. Yes, so yeah. 
none of the, like, if, even if they do find the actual murderer uh, or kidnapper, they won't be tried. Exactly. And also, because so many resources have been used on focusing on Thomas Quick, would anyone want to spend more money trying to find the real perpetrators after they've wasted? Hmm. Like, yeah, and it's just the the victims' families don't get any justice, really. That That justice is taken away from them. I don't know what else we could say about that. No, it's just one big clusterfuck. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so, yeah, next week. It's the final part. It's the final showdown. Yes, we will conclude. Yeah, so in part three, we'll find out more about uh, Stura's therapy, what makes Stura recant all of his confessions, and what Krista van der Quest and Seppa Pentanen felt about it. Yes. So hopefully it won't be as long as this episode. No, it's a shorter one. Yeah, but we'll wrap this up and we'll probably still leave it, leave our heads scratching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> so, so please join us next week. Yeah. For the next part of Stuart Berryville, a.k.a. Thomas Quick. And you can follow us and subscribe to us on Spotify. Amazon Music and Apple Podcasts and YouTube as well. Yeah. All the platforms. Yeah. So see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Thank you for listening to the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find more information about the show on our website at feloniouspod.com or on our Instagram at felonious.pod. Links to our show notes can be found in the episode description, as well as through our website and social media. You can visit our Contact Us page and tell us what you think about the show and if there are any cases you would like us to cover. We hope you join us for the next episode. Goodbye. Bye.